Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Over the next two hours, we'll hear about the process being led by the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee to integrate social and economic objectives into a modernized Columbia River Treaty. Welcome to the session. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available after for you to share or rewatch. Uh, many of you, I recognize many names who have joined. We can see the participants list here. So it's great to see a lot of familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, my name is Brooke McMurchie and I am part of the province of BC's Columbia River Treaty team. And I'm pleased to be your host for the event. I'm grateful to be joining you tonight from the territory of the Lagwangan speaking peoples, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, also known as Victoria, British Columbia. I also acknowledge with deep respect the territories of the Tanaha, the Shkwetmik, the Silks, and the Sinaiqs peoples and neighboring tribes whose territories span the Columbia River Basin. By my count here, there's just over 100 people who've joined this webinar. And if you feel like it, feel free to put your name in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Before we get going tonight, I'd like to take a few minutes to walk through how the evening is going to flow. So in a few minutes, I will welcome uh, Linda Worley, who is the chair of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee, and she'll start us off with an, a few opening words. We'll then hear an overview of the uh, Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee's work to integrate social and economic objectives into a modernized treaty. Uh, and part of that overview is going to involve some highlights about the Columbia River Treaty itself, as well as a high level summary of Columbia River hydro operations. We're then going to dive into presentations about the interests and performance measures for that have been identified so far for the Kimbasket Reservoir, the Arrow Lakes Reservoir and the Lower Columbia. We'll have a little bit of a break between the presentations on Kimbasket and Arrow Lakes interests. And there will be time for questions throughout after each presentation and then again before we adjourn at eight o'clock Pacific time or at the two hour mark. So just a lot of you have probably been part of sessions like this before, uh, but to reiterate, to ask questions, if questions come to mind, please enter them in the question and answer or the Q&A box that's part of your Zoom window. Uh, we will not be monitoring the chat for questions, so please don't put your, your questions or comments in the chat, but instead use the Q&A box. And if you would like to ask your question verbally, you can raise your hand again by using the raise hand function in the Zoom window. Or if you're phoning in on your phone, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And when it's your turn to speak, you'll receive a prompt to unmute yourself. If you're on the phone, you'll be asked to press star six. And if you're on the computer, it'll be a little window asking you to unmute yourself. Uh, once you're unmuted, you can ask your question and then you'll be muted again once, once you're done. So two ways, either typing in your questions or asking them verbally. We're gonna do our best to answer as many questions as we can tonight. And those that we can't answer that are related to the work tonight uh, will be included in the summary report that will come out after these sessions are done. Now, many of you likely know that Canada and the United States met for another round of negotiations to modernize the Columbia River Treaty last week. That is not going to be part of tonight's session. We're, uh, tonight's session does not include an update on those negotiations, uh, but we encourage you, if you would like to know the latest, uh, to go to the province of BC's Columbia River Treaty website to see an update. Uh, the Minister Katrina Conroy, who's the minister, BC minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty, actually issued a statement today on the most recent round. So you can find her statement on uh, the BC, province of BC's website. And I believe we're going to put that into the chat at some point. Uh, it'll also be displayed on our, our uh, slides at the break. So 
without further ado, I think I'd like to pass it over at this point to Linda Worley, who again is the chair of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee uh, to start us off for the evening. Linda, come on over. Thank you, Brooke. And hello, everyone. I'd like to um, say that we're come, I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Columbia Basin Indigenous Nations peoples. And, and grateful to be here. I'd like just to do a little, a little um, opening introduction about the Columbia River Treaty Local Government Committee. This committee has been working together since 2011 to ensure the voices of the basin residents and local governments are heard in decisions about the future of the Columbia River Treaty. I would like to thank the members past and present of this committee for the years of work they have dedicated toward the future health of the basin that has led to this important scope of work. It's been a long journey to take us to this point. We're grateful to the province for their support of the committee, including this work, and to Columbia Basin Trust for their ongoing support on our work for the Columbia Basin peoples and the health of the basin. We appreciate your finding the time to attend today and to listen to the presentations and learn about the immense scope of work presented today that's being done on behalf of the health of the basin in the Columbia system and all living entities within it. Thank you to the socioeconomic integration team who's worked diligently to bring this information to you today. And we look forward to your input on this draft work at the end of this meeting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Linda. I'd now like to welcome our first presenters Cindy Pierce, who's the executive director of the Local Governments Committee and the lead on the socioeconomic integration work. And Ryan McDonald, who is a modeling advisor and, and a principal for McDonald Hydrology Consultants Limited. So the two of them are going to start us off with some contextual information for the evening. And I welcome them both to the stage, Cindy and Ryan. Thank you very much, Brooke. Um, and thank you uh, to Morgan as well, who's in the background from the BC team making all the technology work. Um, and, and also a thank you broadly to the province for their support for uh, this work and the continued opportunity to work together. I also wanna thank the team, um, the socioeconomic integration team for their diligent and thorough work on this. Um, it's, it's been a long haul and we're happy to bring you our draft work that we have here. Um, Brooke has introduced Ryan and uh, Lauren uh, Rithorit uh, from Selkirk Innovates at Selkirk College is our lead researcher and she's taking care of all the uh, PowerPoint uh, clicking um, as well as doing some of the presentation and Avery DeBoer Smith is our engagement coordinator and um, will be uh, working uh, with a Q&A box to make sure we bring forward all the uh, questions in a timely manner. She's also been the wizard behind our website and, um, and our survey. So I wanna deeply thank the team. I wanna thank all you participants for being here tonight. It's great to see the participant list. There's lots of familiar names and maybe we'll get to see faces at one point before, before things end here. Now, for those, um, for, for some of you, there are maybe two topics that are on your mind um, that I wanted to um, address here before we get started, because this is this session is focused on the socioeconomic um, work that we the team has been doing, and we wanted to um, uh, let you know there are other places that you can get information about the treaty. The first one is round 15 of the negotiations. Uh, Brooke mentioned that there was a, a, a round last week, and there isn't <clears throat> excuse me that there there isn't an update included in this webinar, but you can get more information by. Um, going on the CRT uh, Engage site, just Google CRT Engage. And you can also ask questions of the BC team um, by sending an email to Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca. And, and Morgan will kindly put those links uh, into the chat box for you so you can um, get to those if you want to. I know there's lots of interest um, in, in the negotiations. The second topic more locally is the low uh, water levels in the Arrow Reservoir and in the lower um, Columbia River below the, the Arrow, the higher or down. Oh, you can tell how old I am. Below the Hugh Keenly side down. Um, 
we know that is a, as a high interest. It's not the focus of this presentation. Um, BC Hydro is your source of information on that one. And um, there is an email address um, and a phone number you can call uh, to get information about um, water levels. We, we encourage you uh, to uh, register or to ask to be added to the mailing list for the updates that come out weekly about water levels in the reservoirs around the basin. BC Hydro kind of provides that information and it would be really great um, you know, to, to, to get on that list to get those updates. They're very, very helpful. I, I would also mention that um, when you go to the CRT Engage website for the BC team, you can subscribe to the newsletter and um, also uh, register to receive updates. Those are two really good ways to stay up to date about what's happening um, around the treaty. With regards to the Arrow Reservoir levels and the Lower Columbia flow levels, the Local Governments Committee did um, indicate that this was a concern in their 2021 recommendations to the governments involved in the negotiations. And um, we've been use, uh, using this current event to update the data we have around what interests are impacted um, by uh, low water levels. And we'll continue to encourage uh, the Canadian negotiating team uh, to seek solutions to this, um, uh, either domestically or through the treaty, if that's appropriate. Um, it, it is an ongoing concern, and hopefully there is a way to avoid these very, very low, low water levels in the future. So that, um, that allows me to address the two topics that I know are really critical. Now, you're going to see me waving one of my arms here. It's because the other arm is in a sling. I apologize um, that I'm not going to be able to be more animated um, because of that. It also means that we won't be answering the questions in the chat box. Lauren is busy uh, working the, um, the PowerPoint and I'm busy with one, one hand. And so um, we'll, we will, we'll try to answer all the questions during the session and the ones we can't get to, we will, we will put answers in the summary report um, as we've indicated. Now, so Lauren, do you wanna bring up the PowerPoint please share? Your, the PowerPoint? And if you could uh, click through, please, to the, the background. The next one, thank you. So we want to start off by providing some background about the treaty and then about the work that we've been doing. And we know some of you are new to this and the whole, ish, the whole treaty situation is kind of what is it? So we want to start with a couple of slides about what is, you know, what is the treaty, who's who in the zoo kind of, and then we'll go into the work that we've been doing. So the, the, the CRT, as I'll call it, Columbia River Treaty, is a Canada-US transboundary water agreement that was ratified in 1964. The objectives of this current treaty, existing treaty, are power generation and flood uh, management. The, the treaty required Canada to build three dams, the Duncan, King, uh, Hugh Kingley site and Micah dams, and we're gonna talk more about where those are, um, and then allowed U the US to build the Libby Dam in Montana. And that uh, dam creates a reservoir that floods into Canada, the Kukanusa Reservoir, and that it also impacts downstream flows on the Kootenai River. These dams inundated um, 110,000 hectares of ecosystems. They displaced over 2,300 people in approximately 30 small communities, and they impacted economic activities. And this isn't on the slide, but as well, there was no consultation with local folks before the treaty was ratified. Um, that's a large part of the reason that the Local Governments Committee was created and that we are doing the work that we're doing now to ensure that the interests of Basin residents are included in this treaty. And thank you for, to the BC team for uh, being mindful of that. The treaty provides benefits to BC through a one-time prepayment of 60 years of assured flood risk management and 30 years of half of the incremental U.S. downstream power potential. That's called the Canadian Entitlement. So. Um, um, uh, BC um, received 30 years of the, of the payment of half of the expected increase in, in power in the U.S. That happened when the treaty was ratified. Currently, there is annually, uh, annually um, BC has delivered uh, power uh, since 1995 um, for the Canadian entitlement. And so that's an ongoing delivery of that power, and that power can be either used in BC or sold. Um, to generate revenue for the public general funds. Next slide, please. 
the status of the treaty right now is that the, the treaty is evergreen and it continues with the exception that in 2024, the flood risk management approach shifts to a more ad hoc or called upon approach. In 2014, um, both in BC and the US Pacific Northwest, there were treaty reviews uh, to decide whether or not to um, terminate the treaty or to uh, adjust it or keep it as it is. And the decision was to modernize the treaty, not to, not to terminate it. And we provided you a link to the BC decision related to that, uh, uh, that choice. Canada-US negotiations began in 2018. Canada leads the Canadian negotiating team with the full particip participation of BC and the regional Indigenous nations, the Tanaha, Silk Sopanagan, and Shikwetmik nations. And you, as we said earlier, you can get updates on the BCCRT website, and we encourage you again to sign up for the newsletter. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this work in the context of the CRT negotiations today? There's a group called the Columbia River Treaty Negotiations Advisory Team, and they include represent, representatives from all five governments involved in the treaty negotiations, and they do the background work to support the negotiating team. And the advisory team needs to understand how U.S. proposals for treaty changes will impact basin interests, and they need to understand how the treaty can be modernized to increase the flexibility for how Canadian treaty dams are, are operated to improve conditions for BC Basin residents. And those are the two reasons why we're doing this work. Next slide, please. So who is the, or what is the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee, the CRT LGC? As Linda mentioned, this group was formed in 2011 to ensure the voices of uh, Columbia Basin local governments and residents are heard in decisions related to the future of the treaty. It includes 10 elected officials, two each appointed from the four regional districts in the area, and one each from the village of Belmont and the Association of Kootenai Boundary Local Governments, the, the, the organization that re represents all of the local governments in this area. In 2014 and then uh, updated in 2021, the Local Governments Committee provided recommendations to the governments involved in the negotiations, and I provided you a link to those recommendations. The committee has ongoing contact with the negotiating team, with the BC CRT team and the, the CRT Indigenous Nations representatives. And uh, the, the committee liaises with the BC CRT team to resolve local concerns. Some of the issues in communities related to the reservoir operations and dam operations are related to the treaty, but others are topics that can be resolved locally. And as well, this committee leads the CRT integration work, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. We provided a link for the CRT LGC website and also the member list. So if you want to know who the closest representative is on the committee, you can, you can go and look that up. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what are the CRT basin, uh, CRT related basin interests? So these are interests that are impacted by river flow levels or, or reservoir elevations that are, uh, impact, are, are uh, affected by uh, operations under the Columbia River Treaty. Next, click. There are kind of four categories. The first category is indigenous cultural values. And these indigenous cultural values are, are coming from the three regional indigenous nations. Uh, they are bringing that information uh, to um, this, uh, the, the, the modeling process we're gonna talk about tonight and to the negotiations generally. The second category is ecosystem function, which is um, a very high interest for Indigenous nations, and they lead the work around ecosystem function. But it's also a very, this is a very high interest for basin non-Indigenous communities as well, and that's reflected in the Local Governments Committee recommendations. In June of uh, 2022, there was an info session on ecosystem function uh, interests uh, for the CRT, and we've linked um, that, uh, uh, the, the uh, CRT Engage website location um, of that uh, for that info session. And so the ecosystem function spans aquatic, riparian, and, and wetland uh, ecosystems. The fourth category is the socioeconomic category, which the CRT uh, LGC leads, and that includes things like flooding, navigation, tourism and recreation, health, things like dust, agriculture, and erosion. And the last category, not last but not least, because we need to keep our lights on, is power generation. And BC Hydro leads um, the work around the, the, 
of power generation information. So those are, that's the span of the CRT related basin interests that are uh, included in this modeling process we're going to talk about. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over now to Ryan, who's our uh, modeling advisor, to take you through a few slides around uh, the CRT modeling process. So um, you can understand how we're using the information that we're reviewing with you tonight. Thanks, Cindy. And Lauren, yeah, you can just step through this slide. Um, just keep going sequentially. So Cindy already mentioned that, you know, um, really when we're talking about uh, the Columbia River Basin, we're talking about water levels and flows uh, and volumes and reservoirs. So in order to represent these key features of the basin, we need to use uh, models. Uh, and we're using a river management model to do this work. And what this river management model enables us to do is look at alternative um, operations of the system that ultimately allow us to evaluate how operations may affect um, the things that matter. So the indigenous cultural values, ecosystem functions, you know, in this case this evening, socioeconomic values and power generation. So what we've done through this work is, is we've linked um, essentially goals and objectives and, and performance measures within this river management model. And the piece that we'll talk about a little bit later today is the, the performance measure piece. But ultimately what happens is we change reservoir levels um, or stream flow uh, or volumes in the, in the reservoirs, and those then affect the, the performance measures that we're looking at. We can then use that information to ultimately inform that negotiation advisor team that Cindy just talked about. So it's a, an integrated modeling system that really is using, or we're using it to really look at alternative hydro system operation scenarios and looking then at the performance measures that we want to evaluate. Um, next slide, Lauren. So when we think about performance measures, really, um, and Lauren, you can just step through this, this guy as well. Um, really what we're thinking about is, are, are the, the types of things that we care about in the basin. So as a really simple example, we could be looking at, you know, the Kin Basket Reservoir. So this first piece of, uh, you know, where do we want to be measuring things? So Kin Basket Reservoir, and we may be uh, wanting to look at recreation and tourism. So um, we'd start out with the question of why would we want to look at that? And, and ultimately that would be doing something like maximizing the benefits or the quality of the recreation and tourism uh, values. In this case, we've already answered our question of where, which is Kin Basket Reservoir. Uh, given that we're looking at, say, um, reservoir levels, we may we also want to look at when does that matter. So in this case, it's May 1st, October 30th. And then we want to look at some other piece of the, the system, which ultimately in this case is level. And we're looking at um, levels between, in this case, 20, uh, 2434 and 2473 feet. Um, and the performance measure ultimately, so we're measuring something that relates to the value that, that we're interested in. We can then take that information and we can summarize it in a, a form that Lauren and, and folks will walk through later that allows us to measure, um, are we doing better or are we doing worse relative to the thing that we care about? And in this case, more days would be better. So just to give you a, a broad overview of, of what the types of performance measures might be, and really what we're thinking about is um, yeah, the, the area in the basin that we want to look at, uh, when do we care about that thing, and what exactly are we going to measure about it? Now, next slide, Lauren. So the types of performance measures that we've looked at in this uh, piece of work, um, we've got mm -hmm. it sort of summarized into sort of two broad categories. One is this combined performance measures, um, which are essentially uh, for initial scenario evaluation. So we're doing a bunch of scenario work to look at a wide range of different um, types of operations. And we want to get a, a fairly high level screening of what sort of how they're performing relative to these socioeconomic values. If we look at a scenario that's doing fairly well and we say, okay, this thing, you know, is doing what we think it might be doing, um, we can then dive into things called sub performance measures. And these are really looking at specific interests um, in specific areas of the basin. Uh, and we're really trying to dig into the details around how is the performance measure actually working. Um, and as an example, uh, the combined performance measure for say this, again, that Kin Basket, scenario, Kin Basket example is that large scale days of year when water levels are between um, two elevations. And then if we wanna dive into that in more detail, we've also got in the um, tools that we're using, we've got uh, sub measures that relate to higher water debris, um, general shoreline preference, motorized boating preference, and all of these could be looked at as well. 
So um, there's a lot of information um, and there's a lot of information to then summarize to, to help inform um, uh, the negotiation advisory team. So yeah, there's a lot of work going on here, but just so as Lauren walks through this, you guys kind of understand that there's sort of two of these broad categories that we're looking at. Thank you, Ryan, very much. So the process that we've used is to start off by collecting sort of uh, information from past processes and information around community interests. And we got the community interests from uh, a 2014 summary of uh, dam issues, um, pardon the pun, um, that was uh, generated by the local governments committee and, and CBT in partnership. And then we updated it with the results from all of these uh, community meetings that have gone on since. Um, we also looked at all of the past processes that BC Hydro has done, uh, the water use plans for Duncan and the Columbia River, um, and the non-treaty storage agreement review process that was done in uh, 2013, uh, pardon me, 2010. And then we also looked at the CRT technical studies that were CRT review technical studies that were done in, uh, in 2013 to support the, the BC decision around the next steps on the treaty. So we, we collected all that information and we secondly designed the engagement. How were we going to engage basin residents and, and um, the local governments committee members, local governments, and a group called the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee. Now this group is a group that was created in 2014. Its responsibilities are to provide uh, advice on the treaty and to um, provide advice on regional hydro operations um, uh, uh, activities. And that group includes um, about 25 individuals who, uh, members of the public who have come forward, put their names forward in an expression, through an expression of interest, and they are chosen to represent the broad geography and uh, scale of interest in the basin, as well as appointees from the local governments and the First Nations, um, and representatives from the hydro operators in the basin. And so we went through a process of designing, when do we want to get input? How do we want to get input? Um, um, uh, as we went through the process. We, the next step was the initial uh, PM review. We, we brought a draft list of performance measures to the local governments committee and the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee. They gave us some feedback based on their local knowledge. And um, uh, we also identified some uh, new studies, the, especially water use plan studies and other studies from communities, communities et cetera, that were relevant. Um, we, um, um, that then, uh, resulted in a revised set of performance measures. And those are the performance measures we're bringing you now. And uh, could you do a click, Lauren, please? We're in the final stages of the process. We're seeking community feedback. We've had the draft uh, performance measures we're gonna uh, go through with you tonight, have been reviewed again by the Local Governments Committee and CBRAC, and we're now bringing them to the public uh, to see how close to the mark we are. We're expecting some really solid um, feedback from you. Um, and then those will, we will, the team will make recommendations to the local governments committee and, and they will then make recommendations to the negotiations advisory team about what performance measures should go into that, um, into, the, into the modeling process. Um, and then the, and, and the, then the performance measures will be used in a confidential scenario modeling to support the negotiations. And as we know, uh, the work related to the negotiations is, is confidential. So that's the process we've been following and we're near the end of it. So here's a sneak peek at the list of, of uh, current draft um, socioeconomic measures that we're working with for the Columbia section. The reservoirs are down the side and the interests across the top. Um, and next click Lauren, please. And then we have the Kootenai section. Now we're not gonna focus on the Kootenai tonight. The Kootenai is the topic of the webinar on Thursday night, same time, uh, different link. You, you need to register if you haven't already. So going back to the, to the uh, Columbia uh, measures, I just want to point out a couple of things uh, before we get into the details. Uh, if Lauren, if you could click, please. Um, you'll notice, uh, for those of you from Kinbasket, there isn't a health or dust performance measure. And that's because the uh, city of, uh, the village of Vailmont has been doing some studies around the health issues related to dust in their community. And they currently uh, didn't support or don't have enough information to verify that dust from the reservoir, which does happen, there are dust storms, um, is actually having a health impact. So we, ha we have that one on hold. Um, next click, please, Lauren. Um, you'll notice there's no X's in Lake Revelstoke. 
And Lake Revelstoke is the reservoir between the Revelstoke Dam, just outside, just north of the community where I live, um, and just about up to the Mica Dam. And we, in reviewing all of the information that we could find, there were no community interests raised related to reservoir levels. There were no concerns raised related to reservoir levels. And so we don't have any performance measures for Lake Revelstoke. Next click, please. We also um, don't have um, a performance measure currently for navigation in the lower Columbia River. We understand there may be some issues around log towing, but we don't have um, data that we can actually use to uh, uh, prepare performance measure there. So we wanted to flag those gaps for what you might see as gaps um, before we get started here. Next slide, please. So in summary, the process that we're working with is the Columbia Basin Regional uh, Advisory Committee. We've got the chat box over top. Um, local governments, agencies, and the public are providing input to the local governments committee to consider for their recommendations. Next click, please. That information is coming to us as the project team, and our, our job is to complete background research to make recommendations on the performance measure. And we hope we've hosted um, and, um, some engagement activities, uh, such as meetings with particular interest groups, like the Kim Basket uh, Debris Management Committee, to understand their concerns and how they might fit into performance measures, as well as, as hosting these webinars. Our work will go to the Local Governments Committee, and they will make decisions on providing recommendations on performance measures and, and scenarios for basin interests. And that will go, last click please, to the Negotiations Advisory Team. Uh, to use in the modeling scenarios to support their negotiations. So that's the process that we're working in. That's the background. Let's turn over, turn now to some questions, if you have any. Oh, can we go back one slide, Lauren, please? One more click. Very important click at the bottom. I'm tempted. Uh, thank you. You can make it flashing if you like. Um, I'm tempted to put this one in a red uh, uh, exclamation box. This, this is not a one-time only process. Um, revisions will be ongoing based on new information, um, new verified information. Um, this, is a, uh, you know, this is a continuation of the, of the work to some degree that's been done by BC Hydro through their scenario work, a refinement and hopefully improvement reflecting current interests. And it will go on over time as the, the modernized uh, treaty is, is implemented. Okay, now we can go to questions. Thanks very much, Cindy. So welcome to Avery, who's going to uh, read out some of the questions that have entered into the chat. Uh, and I do see hands raised, so we'll we'll get to that as well. But let's start out with the uh, question and answer box. Go ahead, Avery. Great, thanks so much. So the first question is just around uh, why BC Hydro is involved, but not Fortis. So BC Hydro is responsible for the three CRT dams in, in Canada, in British Columbia. Uh, Fortis is not, and so consequently Fortis is not engaged in the CRT negotiations. Excellent, thanks Cindy. The next question uh, is around uh, salmon habitat protection and is that part of the treaty? So um, what the treaty is uh, related to salmon, the part of the, tre the, the treaty uh, influences water flows and reservoir levels. And so, so for those two elements of salmon habitat, yes, salmon is definitely part of the treaty. I think we all know that the other challenge for salmon in the upper Columbia Basin is, is fish passage, fish, fish passage through the dams. And that really is more related to the ownership, the dam ownership. Um, but on both sides of the border, uh, there is work ongoing on salmon uh, recovery. Thank you so much. Uh, Brooke, do we want to go to one of the hands up questions now before we move on to the let's do that and just um, if people are curious to know more about efforts to uh, around salmon there's a website where that captures a lot of the work happening uh, called Columbia River salmon .ca. you can go there and, and read all about a lot of great work that's happening uh, to support salmon on the Columbia River. Um, so I, there's somebody named Chris who has his hand up. I'm going to allow you to talk, Chris, so you'll receive a prompt to unmute yourself. Uh, and once you do that, I invite you to ask your question. Yeah, I'm uh, Chris Hambrook from Town of Golden. 
Hello, Chris. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Um, the one question I have is uh, related more to uh, caribou and caribou habitat. Has that been any point of discussion regarding the treaty? Because with the flooding of the Kinbasket and the Revelstoke Dam, it's destroyed an awful lot of the lower land caribou habitat. Brooke, do you want me to talk about one? Yes, thank you. So um, I, I showed you earlier those four color boxes and there's a, there was a green box that was for ecosystem function. And so um, caribou habitat, for example, would be uh, an ecosystem function uh, interest and it would be handled through the ecosystem function process that is being led by the indigenous nations. Um, and, and I would encourage you to go to that information session to that link that we, I provided there, um, because there is work being done on re potentially reestablishing forest uh, uh, vegetation along the upper elevations of the reservoirs. Um, some of you may have heard of the stable arrow uh, concept, um, uh, and, and that might have benefits for caribou habitat. Yeah. Thanks, Cindy. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks very much, Chris. Okay, uh, back to the questions in the Q&A box. The next one is, is Arrow to be a hydro reservoir as opposed to a storage reservoir? I'm not, if, I'm not certain what is meant by a hydro reservoir. If that means a hydro generation reservoir, uh, there is a small dam on the Arrow Reservoir, the Arrow Lakes Generating Station. It's a tiny little, tiny wee little one, but there is a small dam on the reservoir now on the uh, that, that uses flows from the reservoir now. Um, but the dam, uh, the, the, the main uh, construct, the Hugh Keenly side dam is not electrified. It does not generate power. The Arrow Reservoir is principally for regulating the flows into the United States under the treaty. I hope that answers the question. We can watch and see if we get another one. Thanks. So the next question is to complete a performance measure around navigation and log towing, what information do you require from stakeholders and who do we provide this to? Uh, we'd love to hear from um, the log towing is by Mercer and we'd love to hear from the Mercer contact, uh, particularly um, around what specific days when log towing is interrupted what scale of interruption occurs. We've had great conversations with the uh, Interfor forest managers uh, who handle the log towing in Arrow Reservoir and uh, perhaps contacting them and finding out the information they've provided would help. Um, Lauren is now the keeper of that, uh, uh, of that performance measure and um, perhaps using the uh, info at crt.ca link, uh, you two could get together and run this one to ground. Can I just chime in and say that we have been in conversations with Mercer and we do have some information from Mercer. What we're waiting on now is um, historic flow data to link that up so that we can make a decision on the performance measures. So that's, that's in process, but thank you for the offer and we'll, we'll be back in touch with more info. Thank you, Lauren. So the next question, is there a stable reservoir level planned for Arrow? The process that um, Ryan described, Ryan, do you want to tackle this one? Sure, I can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the process that I described really does look at a range of um, different types of operational scenarios. Uh, we have evaluated different types of scenarios for Arrow. Um, I wouldn't say anything is planned at this point, but they're th those types of scenarios are the types of things that we're looking at. So, um, yeah, those are those are the things that. Um, the local governments committee and others can can bring forward and as well as other interest in the basin and we can look at them in the in the modeling work that we're looking at so yeah hopefully that answers that thank you ryan there is an important word in this and that's planned this is a planning process it's not an operations design process and some people think that um, we will go immediately from performance measures to changes in bc hydro's operations and that's not how it works this is the planning process to expand understanding of impacts and it'll take some time for that to uh, have impacts on, on operations. 
I might want to jump in really quick and remind folks, I see some questions being entered into the chat box and really please enter your questions into the Q&A box uh, because they'll be missed if they're in the chat. So a reminder to folks and uh, on to you, Avery. I think we have time for a couple more questions before moving on to the next. Thanks, Brooke. So the next question is why erosion wasn't included uh, for Arrow Lakes Reservoir. Lauren is the erosion specialist on this one. Lauren, would you like to tackle this one, please? Yeah, we're gonna go over that and can we hold tight on that for just a few minutes and I'll go over that in my slides. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is why the Sinaiics are not included as an ind indigenous partner. The, the, um, the Sinaiics uh, peoples, are in the process of uh, sorting out the um, consultation and engagement process that they wish to have. And the province is working with them on that. With regards to the CRT, there has not been an explicit request to be engaged. And that is, I understand what the status is. I might also jump in and, and let folks know that the, um, the descendants of the Sinaiics are being consulted through the United States process. Uh, so they are, their voices are being heard through the, the process. Um, a more fulsome answer would be more appropriate to go through the, the province of BC. So we'll, we'll hold tight on that question for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. All right, time for maybe a couple more questions. So the next question is around um, Columbia River. So there is a number of agriculture operations that are adjacent or in close proximity to the Columbia River from Canal Flats through to the stretch between Golden and Donald. I see there are no indications in the chart that there has been uh, information of concern related to agriculture in these areas. Can we explain why that is? These areas aren't impacted by reservoir levels or river flows that are impacted by the Columbia River Treaty. And that's the box that this work is, is, is existing in um, to inform the CRT negotiations. Thanks. Uh, so the next question is, the arrow is primarily used for flood control, but is there an interest in upgrading for hydro generation beyond the hydroelectric install in 2001? That would be outside of our scope. And I can say that not to my knowledge, but outside of our scope. And, and maybe I'll also uh, let folks know that things that are out of scope, you know, we'll, we'll take away and see if there's a way to answer some of these questions. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll stick to the topic at hand, which are the social and economic interests uh, for the BC Basin related to the Columbia River Treaty. Thank you. And maybe we've got time for one more question before we jump back into presentations. I think that it, that's it for now for related questions. And there's a couple double questions in there that I see. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Avery and Cindy. Uh, and again, more time for questions throughout. But for now, let's move into the next um, presentation, which Cindy, I believe is an overview of Columbia River hydro operations, just to give folks a sense of, of how things flow, uh, pun intended. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to reiterate the purpose of, of this, this session as Brooke laid it out at the beginning. We want to introduce the performance measures to you, answer some questions, and maybe get some feedback from you around the particular performance measures. We're not expecting this is the only time that um, uh, the only place you're going to be able to provide input. So, so don't get anxious. We really invite you to provide uh, feedback through the online form. Um, and we will be uh, posting the link again at the end of the webinar. And it's on the, uh, on the, the website um, uh, that is linked to all of this work. So we're focused now on the Columbia system overview. And um, um, Lauren, if you could kindly uh, use your pointer to trace uh, the Columbia River, because it's a bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a beast. It starts down at Canal Flats um, um, at uh, Columbia Lake, flows north through the beautiful wetlands, and then up into the bottom end of the Kimbasket Reservoir. Keeps going north, hits Micah Dam, and Cooney, the Canoe River comes in from the north, and then it takes the Big Bend 
and turns south, goes through Lake Revelstoke, um, uh, in, into uh, the Arrow Reservoir, where it goes past, past Revelstoke and then down to Nacusp and uh, keeps flowing south, hits the, the um, Kukinli side dam, um, past Cas and then goes past Castlegar into the Lower Columbia River Trail and then to the border. So it's a, it's a sinuous, um, big, big river. So that's the system we're focused on today. Next click, please. So reservoir levels are basically the result of inflows to the reservoir, less whatever the dam outflows are. And on the Kootenai system, on the Columbia system, pardon me, the, the, the dam outflows are related to uh, the Columbia River Treaty, which um, has uh, includes storage to reduce flood risks. It, uh, the, the Columbia River Treaty relates to US power generation and then to non-power uses both in, in Canada and the US. There is another agreement called the Non-Treaty Storage Agreement um, that affects the flows and the reservoir levels as well. And domestic power generation um, affects the reservoir levels, uh, particularly in Kinbasket and, and uh, Lake, Re Lake Revelstoke. Um, as well, um, in the early 2000s, um, BC Hydro undertook a process called water use planning, and some requirements came out of those water use plans that affects um, the, the level of flows. And you can think about it as a bathtub. I'm thinking of changing this image actually to a bathtub where we have dam, we have, uh, have inflows and outflows, and the reservoir level is basically what the net of that is within the reservoir. So the, the outcome of this is a, an annual cycle of uh, water fluctuations. Next clip, please. And we know we don't want to do too many graphics here, but um, this is one we will be using to summarize the performance measures. And this is for a Kinbasket Reservoir uh, measured at Mica Dam. And it's from 1974 to 2019, roughly when the, the dam was, was functional to when we have the most recent information. And the reservoir levels are on the uh, um, uh, uh, y-axis, the up and down axes, and the months are across the bottom. The blue line, is the average uh, reservoir elevation during um, the period that was uh, that where the sample was taken, 74 to, to 2019. The purple ranges around the blue line are the most um, common uh, range of reservoir levels, the 90th and 10th percentile. So um, the the 90 percent. Uh, between 90 and 10 percent of the flows, uh, the reservoir levels fall within that blue range, and then the gray plot on the outside includes all of the reservoir levels over that period of time, and it, the gray ones are the sort of least frequent. So the the result of the inflows minus the dam outflows generate um, this kind of a pattern within the reservoirs in the basin. Not all of them. Uh, have the same kind of a pattern, but we wanted to give you an example of what um, the pattern the reservoirs look like in the basin. Next slide, please. So let's focus in on Kinbasket. And Kinbasket is the reservoir that is behind the Micah Dam, and it is, is, uh, starts north of Golden on the Columbia River, and it goes all the way up to the village of Bailmont. This a reservoir is, is what I've, been, I've heard called the system workhorse. It's 216 kilometers long. All of the inflows are natural. There's no regulated flows from a, uh, upstream. The outflows are generate are, are managed through the Mica Dam, which is a CRT dam. Um, and um, the flows from Revelstoke uh, go down into the Revelstoke, uh, the flows from Mica go down into Revelstoke Dam. And those two dams together are very large BC Hydro uh, power producers, depending on how you measure it, it's between 30 and 45% of the province's power. Um, in, in a year. It has the largest storage area as well, 12 million acre feet of active storage. Uh, and a, a million acre, uh, a one million acre feet is a foot of water across a million acres of land. It's not small, quite substantial. And as a result, with that scale of storage, um, as that diagram sh I showed earlier illustrates, the annual water level fluctuates by up to 55 feet or 47 meters. It's big. This is the big one in the system. Next slide, please. The, the goals 
Uh, socioeconomic goals for the Kinbasket Reservoir are navigation to minimize the disrupt disruptions to commercial navigation and transportation. And those occur uh, principally in the very south of the reservoir for forestry and in the uh, central area of the reservoir for um, both forestry and uh, tourism um, uh, opportunities. The, the second goal is uh, recreation and tourism to maximize the community benefits from the quality and diversity of recreation and tourism. And again, those are principally at the south end of the reservoir. So there's a number of uh, boating sites and also at the uh, Valemont Marina near the north end of the reservoir, um, just, just south of, of, of Valemont there. And then thirdly, um, we do have a goal for erosion. Um, we've recognized that it is a concern, um, but we, we haven't yet struck the wording around a goal and Lauren will provide more information about that. I want to show you a picture of what 155 feet of water level fluctuation looks like. So this is a picture courtesy of Stuart Rood in, two, in, uh, in July of 2020 uh, at the Valemont Marina um, at the north end of uh, the reservoir. And then here's a picture. Next slide, please. Uh, in June of 2022, when the reservoir was uh, drawn down about 23 meters. And to put this in scale, I asked a few people to walk down to the very end of the boat ramp, which you can see um, here in the picture. And you can see those people down there, the little dots. Those are individuals in this, in this scale. And the, the reservoir looks like this from um, uh, January, February into June, July-ish. Um, and it's 45 kilometers of mudflats with the little old Columbia River, uh, a uh, canoe river flowing through it. It's a very big uh, context. Next slide, please. Over to Lauren. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's dig into what the performance measures are. So for each, uh, when we start each reservoir or river segment, we're going to start with one of these graphs. And Cindy also already kind of described what all of the colors and lines mean. We've plotted. Um, the range of our recommended performance measures on each of these graphs, but that's what these boxes and lines are about. So for Kinbasket, we have uh, two performance measures to show you. One is focused on recreation and tourism, and the other is navigation. The navigation performance measure has four components. So that's these lines here. They're each representing a different site. Um, so you can see that for recreation and tourism, which is this solid box here, based on what we've read from past reports and, and heard from the community, uh, recreational activities are, are most accessible and most enjoyable at the higher end of the range of elevations. And uh, that the community would prefer that those levels are achieved earlier in the year than is is typical through the historic operational regime. And so that's why we're seeing this kind of tail out into the white end here. Um, for navigation, the Wood River site, which is this, this dotted line, you can see through here that it's it's generally okay in all but the most extreme years, this kind of 10th percentile down here. Um, and the same goes for the Brown Creek and Harvey Creek sites here. Um, the user of the, I think it's Schlichting, but I could be pronouncing that wrong, I'm sorry. The Schlichting Creek site uh, would prefer that water levels are higher in the spring and early summer than they typically have been in the past. And we can see that when um, this line is above the average. Uh, so let's get into the details of those measures. The navigation measure is based on the needs of commercial and industrial users uh, who use the reservoir typically for barging. There's four operations that we're aware of. So three forestry companies and one heli skiing company. Um, each has a site that they use and a season when they need access. So the elevations that permit that access are the elevations that we've used to define the performance measure. And these have all been reviewed with uh, industry representatives. For recreation and tourism, we've recommended a two-part approach to the performance measure. And I think Ryan went over this a little bit earlier. We have an overarching performance measure that broadly encapsulates the needs and preferences of a variety of recreational user types across the entire reservoir. Uh, and that's an elevation between 2434 and 2473 feet. 
The minimum elevation, uh, we set that because that's when the Belmont Marina boat ramp operates best. And um, the maximum is a is a couple feet below full pool, which is 2375 in uh, in Kimbasket. Um, and that couple of feet of space allows some room for shoreline use. It also avoids the worst of uh, floating debris, which can emerge at high water, and that and um, that's problematic for a variety of recreational activities. Uh, and so recognizing that recreation is a complex topic uh, with many aspects to consider all sorts of different types of recreation, uh, we've created a list of submeasures that define specific seasons and specific elevation preferences for individual sites, activities, or issues that uh, we know of around the reservoir. So this is the most um, detailed information we have for activities that we have information about. And it's not a comprehensive list. We know that there's definitely activities that we don't have accounted for here. I won't, uh, I won't read all these out. Please go through the background information, have a look and provide your feedback. But um, I just wanted to point out one, which is the Valmont Hot Springs. This is a bit of an outlier that falls outside of the overarching um, performance measure that we had that we had recommended. And that's because it needs very low water to be accessible. Okay, so erosion, thank you for the question on this. We wanted to, to flag that we've been thinking about erosion and we know that's an issue that's important to the community. We know certain areas around the reservoir are experiencing erosion and we know specifically about the Valemont Marina and then some private properties and resource roads along the, the Columbia Reach towards the southern end of the, of the reservoir. Um, but erosion is, is complex. There are many factors that influence erosion, and they're uh, not all related to reservoir levels. If we think about slope, aspect, wind, wave action, all sorts of, of issues affect erosion. Um, so our team is getting together with other Columbia, research, or Columbia River Treaty research teams, those teams that uh, Cindy mentioned at the beginning, the Indigenous Cultural Values Ecosystem Measures, um, erosion, erosion affects all of those. So we're getting together as a big group to discuss how, how best to consider erosion in the CRT modeling process, but we haven't made a decision yet, but it is on the radar. So that's it for the kin basket um, performance measures. And I think we have a bit more time for questions here before we head into a break. We do, thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, and I know there were some questions that were asked just before Lauren's presentation that had to do with hydro operations more broadly. And just to reiterate, we don't have the right folks at this session to answer those questions. So any questions about hydro operations or um, kind of bigger picture thinking, unfortunately can't be answered at this session, uh, but, but hang on to them and maybe direct them towards the hydro operators themselves. Do Avery, do we have other questions uh, that we can ask, ask Lauren at this time? At this time, there's no questions directly related to Lauren's presentation. All right. I know I also reiterate, you'll hear this a lot, but you all are getting a huge amount of information in a short period of time here. Um, all, all of the information about the performance measures that you're hearing about tonight, are detailed on the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee's website. Uh, and we're, we're gonna share a link with you at the break. Uh, and I'm sure one has already been shared in the chat. Um, if you hear things that you're like, okay, that sounds interesting. I wanna know more about it. Go to their website and read through the materials on, on the work that's been done uh, to come up with these performance measures and the, the measures themselves. Um, there's also, you'll hear more about this too, but there's also a feedback survey where you can provide your input on each specific performance measure. And that's also on the LGC website. So you'll get you'll get lots of information or lots of ways to provide your feedback, um, lots of ways to learn more about what you're hearing tonight. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge this is a lot of dense information in a short period of time, so it might take a bit to process. All right. Uh, any questions or do we want to maybe take our break a little early? What are we thinking? One question did just come in that I could Great. put to Lauren. So is, it's around 
if you have any information about plans to revegetate Kim Basket drawdown area as parts of the upper area to help with reducing dust and improve the land when it's dry and dusty. Um, yeah, so related to dust. I can probably tackle this one. Um, so BC Hydro does have a revegetation program. It's a real challenge up there in those very cold, wet ecosystems for a vegetation to get reestablished. Um, so that there is um, a, a, an ongoing uh, a revegetation um, plan. And as Ryan described earlier, when the question around the, the arrow stable levels, um, the scenario work will be exploring different re reservoir levels for uh, Kimbasket as well that would would be um, would promote revegetation, which would impact dust um, as well. Thanks, Cindy. So I don't see any raised hands, and there's a couple more questions that are coming in. Yeah, so some um, questions around uh, ecosystem function performance measures. So maybe we can uh, provide a quick written answer just to direct you the, to another source for that information because we won't be covering that on today's webinar. Great, thanks very much, Avery, that's great. Uh, and we will also, yeah, definitely provide the link to uh, the webinar we held last year specifically on the ecosystem function studies that are, that are ongoing. Uh, okay, so I think at this time we're going to take a quick five minute break so folks can stand up and stretch their legs, grab a glass of water, especially our presenters. And uh, in the meantime, you know, feel free to have a look at some of the resources that have been added into the chat and we'll we'll see everyone back here in about five minutes. Thanks very much to all of our presenters so far and for everybody else's attention. This, this thus far in the session. Hi everyone, welcome back. So at this time, we are going to turn the mic back over to Lauren and Cindy to talk about Arrow Lakes Reservoir interests. So Cindy's already got her camera on. Lauren, you're welcome back whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Lauren, for bringing the slides up. Um, so now we're going to look at um, Arrow Reservoir, and I want to emphasize that we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have not, um, uh, there are not any performance measures for the uh, section of the river between Mica Dam and uh, Revelstoke Dam or, or Lake Revelstoke, um, because we aren't aware of any community interests um, specifically related to reservoir levels um, for that um, that body of water. So now down to, to the Arrow Reservoir. So this one stretches from the community of Revelstoke. I can see it right outside my window, uh, down to just uh, just upstream of Castlegar. It uh, flows uh, by the cusp and a number of uh, small communities, Spokia, Edgewood, Burton, et cetera. And it's important to know that this, um, this area, this river's reach used to have two lakes in it, Upper Arrow Lakes that started at Shelter Bay, if you use the ferry there, um, and went down south of Nacusp. And then there was the Narrows, where the river was and then the lower Arrow Lakes. And so sometimes this is called Arrow Lakes Reservoir as well. I have a aversion to calling these reservoirs lakes. So the name gets shifted around a little bit. So that's the where we're gonna focus now. So this body of water is most important for regulating flows to the United States. That's how it's been described to me. It's 250 kilometers long. Um, the inflows are natural through that, um, that uh, stretch and um, the flows that are regulated through the Revelstoke Dam as well. The outflows are through the Hukimi Side Dam, which is a BC Hydro a CRT dam. It does not have power generation. And the Arrow Lakes Generating Station, or ALGS as it's called, uh, which is uh, owned by uh, Columbia Power Corp, which is a, uh, uh, a collaborative corporation uh, between Columbia Basin Trust and the province. And it has a very small power generator. The storage in Arrow is, is 7.1 million acre feet. If you remember, um, uh, Kim Basket was uh, 12 million acre feet. So, so Arrow is, is smaller, but very important for uh, providing water flows to the US. And it has an annual water fluctuation of up to 66 feet, which is much less than, than the big Kim Basket Reservoir. That's some background on, on this body of water. This one has lots of interests. 
And so lots of goals. First one is navigation. And this is about minimizing disruptions to commercial navigation and transportation. And that is principally through the narrows uh, between Upper Arrow Lake and Lower Arrow Lake. When the water levels get low, it's tough to move logs through there. Recreation and tourism, the same goal as, as for King Basket, maximizing community benefits from quality and diversity of, of activities. And this is true across the range of the reservoir with different um, sort of priorities and uses throughout um, uh, the different sections. So you've got the Revelstoke Reach in the north, and then Upper Arrow and, and Lower Arrow Lakes. And this is one that uh, Lauren has been spending a lot, a lot of time on. Um, uh, understanding the background and, and uh, putting together really amazing information. The third one is uh, dust potential. Um, the goal is to minimize uh, uh, dust generation. Um, and when the reservoir is drawn down, some parts of the reservoir can result in dust around populated areas. Fourth one's around agriculture, maximizing agriculture opportunities. And some of you are probably going, what? We'll explain it in a few minutes. And then the last one is erosion. Um, uh, as was stated in Kim Basket. Next slide, please. And I think it's over to you, Lauren. Yes. Uh, okay, so here is the graph for Aero Reservoir, which shows two of the four performance measures, um, recreation and tourism and navigation, which is all these dotted lines. The other two, agriculture and dust, don't have specific thresholds that we're working against. They apply across the whole range of operations. It's basically, you know, higher is better for one and lower is better for the other. Um, so they're not reflected on this graph. For recreation and tourism, again, in the solid box, you can see, same with Kim Basket, we've got this tail out in the spring where um, folks, recreational folks would generally prefer levels to be higher during those months. Uh, and during what's traditionally been the, the spring recharge period over the last um, 40 years or so of operations. Uh, for navigation, this performance measure is based on Interfor's need to tow logs, throw rafts of logs through the narrows. Uh, so higher water levels allow for bigger tows and more efficient towing. Um, and then the opposite is true for smaller or for lower water levels. So we recommended a, a weighted approach to this performance measure, uh, which matches past practice for other um, performance measure processes that have happened in the past. Elevations above 1400 feet, which is this line here, um, which is, which is when, okay, so below 1400 feet, no toes are possible. So um, above 1400 feet, we start to feel the, see the performance measure kick in. Um, and so that's usually achieved, except for in the, the early spring here. Um, the next threshold, which allows for movement of, of medium-sized toes, generally occurs in sort of the last half of the year here, if we're looking at this um, blue line as the average. And then uh, 1,420 feet and above, that's got, that's kind of the optimum when they can move the, the biggest uh, toes and that happened you know it's a little bit shorter range than what we were seeing for um, the medium-sized toes uh, so we just discussed navigation i don't think I, I need to talk about that anymore but let's talk a little bit more about recreation and tourism the range we're recommending for that overarching performance measure is 1,420 to 1,437 feet from April 1st to October 15th. And that's a season that's been um, recommended through past studies that have undergone um, public consultation. That minimum elevation was selected uh, because there's important shore-based recreational assets in the Revelstoke Reach that flood. Uh, when the level is 1,424 and above. So we want to leave the sun room there for recreation around um, Revelstoke. And the maximum elevation was, uh, again, partially based on a, an asset in Revelstoke, the Revelstoke boat uh, launch, which is the only boat launch in that kind of upper part of Arrow. Um, it has a tow elevation of 1,434 feet. So we wanted to leave some room for, for operation of that boat ramp. In terms of uh, sub measures for aero recreation, there's lots. We have uh, more information on this reservoir than we do for others, and partially that's because of some 
uh, studies that have happened in recent years that have provided uh, lots of information for us. Um, one thing I wanted to note about the sub measures is that uh, we've differentiated between access and experience here. Access is, of course, uh, very important. You can't do the activity without being able to access. Um, but experience measures are also important because they help us understand whether uh, an activity is desirable or not. Um, and we can see that come out in, the, in these some of or we can see that difference come out in some of these performance measures. So for example, because of long boat ramps built by BC Hydro, um, so this performance measure down here, uh, motorized boating access is possible down to about 1400 feet. Um, but there's recognition that because of hazards that exist in the reservoir at that level, boating doesn't really become desirable until much higher around um, 14. 24 feet. So we just wanted to point out that difference. At dust potential, the research team has heard about two main areas around the reservoir where dust has historically been a concern at low water levels, Burton Flats and the Revelstoke Reach. Uh, we've also heard that dust concerns around Revelstoke have, have, have largely subsided over the past several years, and that's as, as a result of revegetation of the shoreline. So the performance measure that, that we're recommending is really based on uh, the Burton area. To develop the performance measure, we reviewed satellite imagery um, from a low water year and outlined areas there, uh, outlined areas that were exposed at low water levels and didn't have any vegetation on them. And then we ran those um, polygons through a computer model to see what area of those potentially dust producing polygons would be exposed at various water levels. So the performance measure is a function of the number of days exposed um, each day during the dry season or April to mid-October and um, the number of hectares exposed each of those days. So we've heard um, a little bit of concern about the, this recommended performance measure and specifically about the uh, potential aspect of dust potential. Um, like erosion, there's many factors that influence dust generation beyond simply uh, water or water levels and reservoir elevations. So we're looking at ways to potentially improve the precision of this performance measure, which we're not considering final at this time. Um, and, and you can help with that. We're, if you have evidence of dust storms occurring anywhere on the reservoir, not just around Burton, um, and specifically, if you have dated pictures, we would love to see them. And we invite um, we invite you to share them with us. Please send them our way. Over to you, Cindy, for agriculture. Okay, agriculture. <clears throat> so, the historically there were um, many um, thriving farms along the reservoir, particularly in the Revelstoke Reach, but also around the communities of Burton, Fouquier, Edgeworth, Renata, and Deer Park. And if there if um, reservoir levels were kept low and certain areas of the reservoir that used to be cultivated were going to be not inundated in any one year. That area could be used either for grazing or for seasonal crops. And that is already being done by a farmer here in the, in the Revelstoke area. He actually has leases on, on some lands and, and, um, and he's interested in, in doing more. So we have a performance measure that for the area that is not inundated within the existing leases and the previously cultivated lands uh, be, between the growing season, April 1 to September uh, 15th. Um, and that would again just be for seasonal uh, crops. Now, we recognize that these areas um, line up with the areas that are where there's interest in um, uh, re establishing uh, natural vegetation, natural ecosystems. And so um, we, we would need, you know, if this goes forward, there would need to be some agreement around which areas were going to be for ecosystem restoration and which areas might be for seasonal agriculture. And, you know, this is, uh, this is particularly important in the Revelstoke Reach, uh, where there were uh, a number of small communities and, 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 and farm operations. Um, and the reservoir, is, uh, the reservoir levels mean that the land is not inundated as much because it's at the upper end of, uh, of the reservoir. So that's the context for the agriculture potential performance measure. 
Uh, so e Erosion for Arrow will reiterate uh, that the socioeconomic research team is convening with other Columbia River Treaty research teams to um, discuss how we should collectively address erosion through our collective bank of performance measures, understanding that the factors contributing to erosion are many um, and complex, but we've heard many sites around the reservoir that are experiencing erosion. Um, that's this sort of big list here, and we've documented those and uh, they are on our radar. That's it for Eero. Do we want to move into questions? Yes, let's do it. There's a couple folks who have their hands up and um, there's a couple questions in the Q&A box. Let's start with the hands to begin with this time. Uh, so Buzz, I know you've entered something in, in the chat, but I'm going to let you ask your question verbally. Is it is it different than what you entered into the chat? Go ahead, Buzz. Okay, um, it's just the, the fact that there's so much confusion coming from the trust, but not the trust, the, the agreement. And like I read that the um, Kootenai River is going to many, be so many thousand acre feet of water discharged into the Columbia Lake. And the total flow of Finley Creek be direct, directed into the Columbia Lake. And I want to know is what the temperature drop would be approximately in Lake Windermere for summer recreation with that water coming in. I have a feeling that's not something that folks on this this call could answer. Yeah, that's the. I mean, okay. good, good okay. pondering. Yep. <laughs> uh, One there, more there. question then. One more okay. question. Go for um, it. In the uh, regular agreement, it. it, it first agreements that came out that said there's going to be three storage dams between Invermere and Golden for holding water to make electricity for the hungry lower mainland. And um, would there this dust problem be created there eventually just the same because the only time to hold water is in the spring? I'm not sure, Buzz, are you, re are you referring to um, the reservoirs that were said to have been made between Invermere and Golden? I, there, yes. there are none. Yes. Yeah, there are none. That's, go ahead, Cindy, yeah. Have they been taken out I, of the agreement? Yes, early on, there were several different um, arrangements for damming across the Kootenai and Columbia system. A whole bunch of different approaches um, were investigated by the US and Canada together. And those dams were never implemented. The, the dams Thank that we're you. focused on today are the ones that are in the treaty and have been implemented. What, is the Kootenai River flooding going to be controlled by dumping the Kootenai River into, uh, into Columbia Lake? Uh, Buzz, that, we're not in a position to answer those questions. I'm sorry, I'd really encourage you to direct, uh, to send an email or, or make a phone call to the BCCRT team. They're the ones that can answer those questions, I'm, I'm certain. Thank you very much. Thanks very Thank much, Buzz. Question. All right, what, why don't we go to the Q&A box now? Sure, thanks. Uh, we just had one uh, clarification question around Kukimi side being not being or being a power generating uh, dam. Uh, so if we could clarify that, because there's some information on the Kukimi side website that says it's a power plant, but then we mentioned that it's uh, not power generating. So the, 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 the BC Hydro Dam, the Hugh Keenly side dam itself is not power generating. That's the portion that BC Hydro built under the treaty and um, it doesn't have any power generation uh, specifically. There was a power generating plant built next door to that dam, the Arrow Lakes Generating Station that does generate power through, and it's, that is owned by Columbia Power Corp. And I, I apologize for creating confusion earlier on. I hope that clarifies things. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, so another question, uh, I believe to Lauren around recreation and arrow, and there was someone wondering if you'd ever come across any information around windsurfing uh, relating to recreation and tourism, or and sailing, anything in that realm. 
No, we haven't. And we, if you go into the info sheets, you'll note that we have a big um, list of potential recreational activities and we have information for 10 or 20% of them and we don't for the others. The focus of, for this round of um, research was really focusing on existing information and obvious um, consultations with community members when we knew there was, was, there was an existing gap that we knew about that would be easy to fill. Um, but there's always more work that could be done um, understanding recreational values. We've got a good a good sense of, or a reasonably good sense for Arrow, understanding that we still have major gaps and, and that that's even much better than we do for other reservoirs. So we no, we don't have any information on um, wind-oriented sports for Arrow. Send it our way. And another maybe similar question, but it's around fire threat around Arrow, if that's been considered in the research. We haven't considered fire threat. Uh, that our our research is really parameterized by um, issues that are affected by reservoir flows or river flows or or reservoir elevations, and so those are the main um, values that we're honed in on. I think let's go. We have one more raised hand here. Uh, so I'll invite Bill to ask his question. Bill, if you still have a question for the group, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. We'll give it a moment. All right. Uh, if there are there other questions that can be answered from the Q and A's, or shall we move on to the next presentation? Yeah, I think uh, we're at time here, so probably time to move on. Thanks. Let's do that. Thanks, everyone. Back to you, Cindy and Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, now we're getting down to the, the bottom end of the system, the Lower Columbia River. We just call it Lower Columbia for being short. And this is the, the portion of the free, the remaining free flowing portion of the river uh, um, in the, in the uh, Columbia system, the downstream Columbia system, from the Hugh Keenly side and ALGS dams um, through to the U.S. border, flowing past Castlegar Trail, Janelle, um, uh, Fort Shepherd, et cetera. Uh, next click, please. So this is essentially the delivery route of the flows to the United States. It's 86 kilometers long. And there are uh, natural inflows, some large creeks do flow in in this little short section, but most of the flows are regulated. The flows from the Columbia River are regulated by the Hugh Keenly Side Dam and the Arrow Lakes Generating Station. From the Kootenai River, which, which joins the Columbia uh, just at, the, just, uh, at Castlegar, uh, that uh, river is regulated by the Brilliant Dam and Expansion Project, which is the Columbia Power Corp um, uh, uh, facility. And then the Ponderé River, which flows in just at the border, is regulated by Juanita Dam owned by BC Hydro and the expansion project owned by Columbia Power Corp. So this section of the river is very highly regulated. And there are weekly fluctuations in that, uh, in the, uh, often there are weekly fluctuations um, in, the, in the river flows and the, the levels of the river to meet BC fish flow uh, uh, needs and to meet the flow requirements into the United States, which are both for power and for, and for fish. Next slide, please. So we have two um, goals for the low, lower Columbia based on the current uh, available information. The first is flooding to minimize damage to private property and community infrastructure and injury to people. And the second is the recreation goal that we've had in the, uh, for the rest of the year, maximizing community benefits for quality and diversity of recreation and tourism. Now, there are two reaches um, in this, um, in this uh, section. One is the Robson Reach from the uh, uh, Hugh Side Dam to the confluence with the Columbia at Castlegar, and then the, the main Lower Columbia Reach. Now there's a, um, a water station that we use to um, measure the flows here, and it's at the Birch Bank Water Station, which is kind of in the middle of the, the main Lower Columbia flow. And this is part of the reason why we're still struggling with the, the Mercer towing uh, navigation information is getting flows in the upper reach. We don't have a, a station. Over to Lauren, I think, unless flooding is, oh, yep. So, so this is the graph for the lower Columbia, which is, as Cindy just mentioned, is measured at Birch Bank. Important to note here that the measurement units are not elevation. 
um, but instead flow units. So we've got cubic meters per second and cubic feet per second. Um, we have two performance measures for this reach. There's two components to the flooding performance measure, which are the boxes here, one for infrastructure damage, which is this wide dashed box. So that's the more severe flooding. And you can see that happens uh, very rarely with um, 2012 being the year in recent memory when there was significant damage due to flooding that year. And um, Cindy will talk about that a little bit more. The second component of that flooding is low-lying low flooding. Uh, and you can see that that happens more frequently since the 90s, um, but uh, still in that top 10% of flows, so still relatively rare. Then um, there is recreation and tourism, which is this dash dot box down here. Um, and that shows a bit, a bit of a different pattern than we've seen for the reservoirs. You can see there's no tails sticking out into the spring. Um, when recreationists would like the, the river to be higher. And that's because uh, this is a, a free flowing section of a uh, river. It's not a, a reservoir. And recreationists on rivers tend to prefer tend not to prefer high water because it, it can be dangerous. Um, you can see that the historic flows here, the average flow aligns pretty closely with recreational preferences, except for kind of six weeks in the spring and summer um, when we see average flows go above preferred levels, at least based on the information that we currently have. Cindy? So on the flooding performance measure as, as uh, thank you, Lauren, sorry. On the flooding performance measure, as uh, uh, Lauren has mentioned, there are two there are two elements, and I want to say we've spent a lot of time on on these um, flooding measures um, across the basin. We've we've done that to make sure they are correct uh, as correct as we can with current information. And I want to thank the four local governments in the area um, for their help with uh, understanding the local flooding uh, concerns, sending me pictures, etc. So for low level, for flooding of low lying areas, basically recreation areas um, over the length of the reach, uh, based on uh, pictures that came in this year when the river uh, levels started to go up um, a bit and flooding started to happen, we've, uh, we've set the, the level at uh, 151,500, 151,500 CFS, and that's year round. And this is the numbers of days per year is where we, you get to that level. And less is obviously better. And so we're quite confident um, um, with that number because we, it's based on um, you know, recent photography uh, dated photos, which are super helpful in this work. Uh, next click, please. This, the second performance measure is around infrastructure damage, which is you know, really very critical. And this, uh, and for this one, the performance measure is set at uh, flows above 214,000 uh, CFS. And this is based on uh, uh, information from uh, emergency management folks and, and city staff in 2014, and also uh, BC Hydro's uh, responses to um, the, uh, the flood uh, risk event. Now, this is based on um, uh, potential for damage to the Castle Garcia ponds, to recreation infrastructure, not just flooding low-lying recreation areas, but recreation infrastructure and access at Janelle and the septic tank uh, systems down there that, that levels above this would cause a, a problem. Um, we do need better information here, and we are um, strongly recommended in red text that there be a joint local government flood inundation mapping uh, project to, to refine uh, these numbers, because uh, this is uh, a key local flooding uh, interest, concern, um, across the basin. And we want to make sure you know these numbers are as good as they can be uh, accounting for all potential uh, impacted interests. Thank you. Now we also um, doing a count of the number of days is kind of helpful, but really it isn't just the number of days when you're above the uh, these these flow levels. It's also how many days is the flow level reached and how many years is this happening? And so we have some measures um, at a, a defined set of flow levels um, that, uh, that, that document um, what the potential impacts might be, um, including not just total number of days, but um, these, these details.
Uh, so for recreation, the, the preferred flows that we've recommended for the overarching recreation uh, and tourism measure are between 40,000 and 100,000 CFS between May 1st and October 31st. Uh, and that minimum elevation was recorded as the minimum preferred elevation for boat-based angling. So that's where that came from. And the maximum elevation reflects the, reflects the preferences of non-motorized boaters, swimmers, and shore-based anglers. It's important to note for this performance measure that much of the data we have access to is really dated, much of it from um, the early 1990s. And we do have some questions about um, the validity of the data. And that comes out in the uh, sub-measures. For example, if you could see that we have uh, boat-based angling at a, at a lower range than we do for shore-based angling. So, you know, we have some questions about these figures and um, have recommended some updated research to gather more current perspectives on recreational access needs and preferences along the lower Columbia. And that's it for lower Columbia. Thanks very much, you two. Avery, any questions we want to direct to the presenters? There's no question specifically related to the presentation that we just received, but we do have some more general questions or some questions for older performance measures if we wanna uh, talk about those now or save them to the end. Uh, we, do, we do have time and in the absence of other questions, let's go for it. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you. There was a question about how the Tanaha Kim Basket were engaged in this process. I will take that on because I was, this was before Lauren was actively involved. Um, early on, thank you for the question. Early on, um, the, I met with the uh, CRT Indigenous Nations representatives, um, the people that are involved, the individuals who are involved in the CRT negotiations from each of the uh, three nations. And I laid out the process and uh, let them know that we wanted to respectfully engage with Indigenous nations in, in whatever way would work best for them. We wanted to build that into our process. And we've left the door open for them to uh, come back to us and, and ask us, um, tell us what they want. And we've, we've, we've not heard um, anything specific. We know that these sessions are, have been advertised um, within um, the Indigenous nations. And we're hoping that some Indigenous peoples will join the session and provide us with some feedback. Um, yeah, the door is always open. Um, and that's the way we've left it with the nations. Thanks. Uh, so we have a question about what gauge was used for the flow metrics for Lower Columbia? That's the Birch Bank gauge at Water Survey of Canada, Water Survey, Water Survey of Canada gauge. Um, we also have a question, I think, uh, about comparing uh, different types of research. So could ecological concerns on the drawdown of the arrow be weighted more heavily than concerns for recreation and navigation? So what is the difference between ecosystem and socioeconomic, for example, and how they're weighted? There is no weighting of the performance measures at this time. We are simply you know, running it through the model and um, reviewing the results and getting to understand how the model is um, responding to different scenarios. Uh, that's the state that we're at at the moment. Great. Uh, yeah, so another question here. Um, they're all coming in really quickly, so just give me a second to, to read them as they appear. Um, so what happened when the highest flow occurred on the lower reach? Um, why is the range so large and how can we make sense of this for understanding impacts? Um, and will we have any warning or reason for these large variations of flows? And I assume this is about flooding in lower Columbia? It doesn't specify, but I would assume. Well, the, what happened that, um, that was most drastic was that the sewer ponds uh, adjacent to Castlegar began to subside was the term. That's not a good thing. Um, so that was one of the consequences that we, want, we wanted to avoid by the high, high flows. Um, there is a you know, big difference between the, the 251.5 and the 214,000 CFS flows in the, in the measures. Those reflect 
uh, what the impacts are for those performance measures as they are described. Thanks. There's a raised hand, so I think I'll jump in and, and uh, allow somebody to ask their question verbally. Ian, go ahead. They may have troubles unmuting themselves. So Avery, why don't you go ahead and we'll see if we can work that out on our end here. Sounds good. So the next question is, there have been talks about a weir over the reach. This could alleviate the dust problem and keep the elevation level more stable, allowing more recreation around the north end of the reach. Uh, is there a chance that this talk could be reopened? I suggest that's out of scope. We might direct that question to the Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca. Thanks. And then just the last one is not a question, but I think more of a comment for Lauren, someone really encouraging you to reach back out to Mercer regarding the challenges with low and high outflows. Uh, sorry, Mercer and Interfor. These are mm -hmm. their challenges in managing the ponds and feeding the mills at low outflows. Thanks. We're, we're in touch with one of your staff and, and we'll reach back out. Um, Great. Yeah, I think I think we're closing in. Um, the people who have their raised hands who weren't able to ask them their question verbally, if you want to enter it into the Q&A, go for it. Uh, I, I hope that there were no technical difficulties there, but if there were, we'll work them out afterwards. And I think I think we're at the point where we can move on to the next section. Um, unless there's, oh, I see there's a couple of other questions coming up. I'll, I'll leave it to you, Avery, to decide whether they're questions related to what our presenters can answer or if we uh, should move on to the kind of final portion of the evening. Yeah, I think we might as well move on. And I think there are questions that can be answered at a later time by people with more information on those topics. Wonderful. Thanks, Avery. And actually, I believe the next portion of the evening is yours. So <laughs> go ahead and uh, and you've got the stage. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Brooke. So we, we're just really encouraging everyone who's been on this webinar so far to visit the website. We're going to repost it again in the chat, but it's a website that has all the information about each of the socioeconomic performance measures for the Columbia system and also for Kootenai. And it's everything we've talked about tonight, but more in-depth information. So you can take your time, you can go through each of those. Uh, and then we also have a survey. This is our way that we would love to collect feedback from each of you on this webinar. Please feel free to share this information with your community members or your constituents. And this is how we can take your feedback into account for updating the performance measures. We would really love to hear from you. So we really encourage you to take that time. Uh, again, those links are up on the PowerPoint here, but we're also gonna post them in the chat. So they're really easy for you to access. Um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions about that, but we really look forward to hearing your feedback in our survey that's posted on the website, and we'll also share the link again in the chat box. And uh, I think I can hand it back over to Brooke. Thanks very much, Avery. We do have time now for, for other questions, uh, and again, questions related to the development of these socioeconomic performance measures uh, along the Columbia River. Uh, we don't, you know, we still see a few questions. I know you're super curious about uh, all sorts of issues related to the Columbia River Treaty and more broadly hydro operations, et cetera, but um, we, we don't have the right people to answer those questions for you here. As Cindy was has said a few times, uh, your, your Columbia River Treaty related questions can be sent to the province of BC's email address at Columbia River Treaty at gov dot bc dot ca and we'll put that in the chat uh, but now we've got a little bit of time here for final questions on the uh, performance measures we heard about this evening don't see any final questions coming up um, there's some some good information being shared in the chat Thanks for those who are engaging there. Uh, and 
And also to remind folks that we have another session on Thursday evening focused on the Kootenai River interest. So very similar session to tonight, except focused on uh, the, the reservoirs and river flows along the Kootenai River. Uh, somebody has asked if there will be a meeting on ecological measures and, and I think we'll put a link to the session that we held last May, uh, specifically focused on the ecosystem studies that are that are ongoing uh, in tandem with this work. So we'll put that link in the chat. You can watch the recording of that session. Uh, phenomenal amount of information on the, the efforts to uh, seek ecosystem improvements through the treaty. All right. Well, thank you all once again. Uh, and I think at this time, I'll, I'll welcome back Linda Worley to say a few words in closing before we, we truly wrap up for the evening. Um, Linda, you can go ahead. Oh, great picture behind you. Go ahead, Linda. <laughs> great, thank you, Brooke. And uh, we'd like to extend our sincere appreciation to the team for this webinar and to all of you for participating. Um, I expect you can see the great value in this work, and, and it's been a great uh, pleasure to be involved in this, our, our Columbia River Treaty Committee, as well as working alongside the, um, the team. So we ask that you please provide your feedback through the online survey, and as always, um, your input and yourselves are very important to us, and it's very valuable to this work ongoing. We ask that you watch for information on an upcoming public webinar and hope that you can join us on February 2nd for this uh, next in the series of webinars, which is focusing on the Kootenai system. And as always, for more information on the work of the uh, Columbia River Treaty Local Government Committee, please go online to our website to see the latest information on the committee and its work on your behalf. And that is crtlgc.ca. And thank you so much for taking the time to be here this evening. Thanks very much, Linda. Uh, and you know, thank you from me again. Truly, thank you to all of our presenters here tonight: Linda, Cindy, Lauren, Ryan, uh, and Avery and Morgan for supporting us in the background here and um, answering some of the questions that were raised through web links, etc. Uh, do stay tuned to the Columbia River Treaty website, the province's website for updates on treaty negotiations. You know, our, our information is uh, consistent as the negotiations are ongoing. So there will be an opportunity in the future to hear more about that, similar to, to these types of sessions. Um, but for this work in particular, really reiterate to, to visit the local government committee website and and provide your feedback on this work this is um there's been an incredible amount of research done and i and i applaud the research team for all of the hours sifting through past public consultation reports and and really trying to and talking with folks uh, across the basin trying to really understand what issues matter most to them and what would make a difference in a modernized treaty so thank you again for all of the work that you've done uh, again, the recording of this session will be available, if not tomorrow, the day after on YouTube, and we'll be emailing it out to everyone who registered for this event. So if you need to go back and, and review anything, you'll have the opportunity to do that. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll also look forward to seeing you at the, at the next session if, if you're at all interested on Thursday. Uh, we will end the recording here in a bit, uh, but we can leave the the meeting running in case folks want to browse the chat or or the Q and A's, maybe to read some some of the comments that were made. But uh, at this point, I think we'll say once again, thank you very much. Uh, and the the final piece I almost forgot to mention is that there will be a summary report of this session where the the questions related to this topic will be uh, responded to. So you'll have a written form of uh going back to check on what was said here tonight thank you all once again for your time and your ever going interest in in these important issues and we look forward to seeing you at the next session take good care <laughs>